the last session looks at the uh, research and development of new products coming from Cybermarine. Our first speaker is Dr. Eli Rudebeck, uh, a postdoctoral researcher at Deakin University. Eli will tell us about glycolipids. Take it away. Thank you for your kind introduction. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen and hear me. I'm going to assume yes. Uh, as Ivan said, my name is Ellie. I work with Colin at Deakin University in Australia. And our part of the project is looking at glycolipids. So we know that there are a number of interesting lipids that we can isolate from marine material, the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, um, Bode was talking about phospholipids previously, um, but our interest is in these glycolipids, particularly from marine material. We are interested in these glycolipids because they have a lot of uh, unusual, or not unusual, but useful properties. So a simple example I've put on the screen is cocoa glucoside. And if you have an environmentally friendly or green shampoo and conditioner, you might see that listed as an ingredient. Um, glycolipids have a sugar, which is the glyco part, and a fatty acid or alcohol, which is the lipid. And they have obviously that amphiphilic versus amphipathic, sorry, amphiphilic, sorry, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic end, sorry, that Bodhi was talking about, that make them good as surfactants. So a lot of the glycolipids that we see in the literature are natural surfactants. They are emulsifiers, they're biodegradable, non-toxic, and they require low concentration to have that emulsifying capability. And so we see these listed as ingredients in cosmetics, cleaning agents, and detergents. In some recent examples, you can see that there's a lot of interest in glycolipids as consumers move towards more environmentally ingredient, friendly ingredients for their everyday products. So some companies have taken advantage of this. This is Glycosurf, which looks at supplying commercial entities with glycolipids for their natural surfactant abilities. But apart from their physical properties, glycolipids also can exhibit bio, bioactivity. So some can um, act as anti-inflammatory agents, some have antibacterial properties or antifungal properties, and that makes them very useful in the development of pharmaceuticals, but also cosmetics and health and beauty products. You have an emulsifier that acts as an anti-inflammatory in your face cream that can be very beneficial. And in the food industry, something that's antibacterial can be very useful in preventing spoilage. Um, recently, natural glycolipids that are derived from mushrooms. So fermentation of mushroom material were approved in Australia and New Zealand. And I think they're working in the US as well um, as a pre preservative for soft drinks. Um, and there's also been research into glycolipids uh, for spore prevention for uh, preventing spoilage in other food products. So these glycolipids are really interesting and we want to work more with them. Most of the glycolipids that are used at the moment come from microbial fermentation. So the fermentation of mushrooms in that previous example or bacteria or yeast. And the reason that we see them come from these natural sources is that the synthesis of a molecule like a glycolipid where one of the alcohol groups on a sugar reacts selectively is something that's done very well by nature, but is less easily done by chemical means. So I come from a synthetic chemistry background and to try and get a chemical catalyst to selectively pick this particular alcohol group on a sugar molecule is difficult and can be quite expensive. Um, but enzymes do this really well. So my product, uh, my project in a nutshell is to look at 
selectively making glycolipids that have interesting structures uh, and developing a method where enzymes can be used to make these interesting molecules. And this has been done previously, um, but the literature really focuses on using conventional solvents, so things that are volatile or potentially environmentally unfriendly. And of course, plant and food and Deacon and Collins group, we look at green chemistry. So I'm going to try to develop a method to do these reactions in a green alternative solvent. Bodhi introduced these nades that I'll be working with, uh, natural deputectic solvents. These are green, biodegradable, non-volatile, non-toxic, and quite inexpensive. They come from natural ingredients. So one combination is choline chloride and urea, the readily available cheap ingredients from natural sources. And as he mentioned, when you mix the two solids that are a component of the nades together, they go from being a solid material to a liquid, much like an ionic liquid. So they're very interesting solvents and completely biodegradable. Uh, they I think Bodhi mentioned they were looking at nades for extraction. I'm looking at using them as a reaction solvent. So at Deakin, that's what I'm doing, looking at a method or developing a reliable method for the green synthesis of glycolipids using enzymes, natural materials, and natural deputectic solvents. And once we have that method set up, I wanna look at making glycolipids with specific functional, physical, and biological properties. Can we tailor the emulsifying or surfactant activity by playing around with the structure of the glycolipid? Can we influence the biological activity by changing the sugar unit or the lipid unit? Um, and I also have a PhD student working with me, Sudarshan, who's shown on screen, and he's going to work more on the identify, identification and analysis of glycolipids. So developing a reliable method to isolate, identify, and even quantify the glycolipids that are in samples that we obtain. And so the ultimate blue sky, anything's possible dream for my part of the project is to take lipids that are isolated from marine material, use the green chemistry reactions that I'm going to develop and turn that product into functional glycolipids that have interesting physical and biological properties and can be a useful value added product for commercialization. And thank you all for listening. I'll hand it back to Ivan. That was very smooth, um, Ellie. Well thank done. <laughs> well done. Um, next up, we'll hear from Ian Hosey, the founder and the founder and the director of Nanolayer Limited. Uh, screen is yours, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've got a very um, long and deep relationship with Plant and Food Research and a number of people in the room. Um, it's great to see everyone again, um, if virtually. Um, we're going to talk about um, our product, uh, Active Layer, uh, um, and its new term, Derma Layer, as well. Um, so, just first, for those who don't know about Nano Layer, um, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, well, we used to be Revolution Fibers. Uh, some people will know us as, as that name. Um, we've had quite a lot of change in our business, um, a lot of it um, in relation to a high amount of growth through the product um, that we're talking about, Active Layer, um, and a lot of it through some uh, recent investment. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, we've, we've had 500% growth recently. Uh, we've been moving our Dermalayer uh, Life Sciences platform. It's pretty much our priority area as a business now. Um, we've got four large scale uh, machines dedicated to the production of uh, rolls of collagen textile, uh, which goes under the name Dermalaya. Now uh, we've moved into a, a large factory. We went from a 350 square meter facility to a 5,000 uh, square meter campus. Um, and we've had quite a lot of staff movement. Um, 
Uh, so we're looking at, we went from 12 to 70, 70 staff now. Um, a lot of them in production and R&D around, uh, around this product line. So yeah, quite a lot of changes. Um, and I guess because of that, we changed our name uh, just to re reflect the, the new era of our company. And uh, yeah, if you didn't know, uh, I guess we, we make a whole range of nanofiber products. Um, so it's not just marine nut nutraceutical uh, based products. We also work in uh, composites, acoustics, air filtration, much like the masks that everybody are, are wearing. Um, active layer is, you know, it, it looks like a new product to a lot of people in the market, but for those in the room who know it, there's, there's a hell of a story behind Active Layer. Um, it's um, at least 12 years of research, um, not just on uh, how we turn marine collagen into a fiber and, and a cosmetic um, platform, but also in the extraction side. And that's where we've had a very close relationship with uh, Sue and team, um, Sanford as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's the sort of relationship that we want to see um, more of uh, and, and we ourselves have a lot of um, ambition uh, to I guess complement our active layer and dermal layer technology with marine nutraceuticals in the future. So what is active layer? Um, it, we've kind of created a new category uh, of cosmetics in, in the you know the hero kind of market of, of South Korea. Um, basically we are creating collagen films. They're, they're now known as cosmetic films. And these are fabrics, which are all natural, typically, um, that dissolve into the skin. So we're talking about, um, I've got some a video to show in the next slide, but effectively removing all synthetic ingredients using a process called electro spinning, we can create fibrous um, sheets, um, more like rolls, and we can carry a, a huge number of ingredients in those sheets. Um, so we've got 13 different formulations that are either in market or approaching market. And usually that's with the collagen as the base. And then we have, you know, ingredients such as hyaluronic acid, uh, vitamin C, um, some proprietary ingredients for some of the brands that we work with. Uh, but the core ingredient is type one marine collagen sourced uh, from New Zealand hokey skins. And as mentioned, a lot of the um, IP and the novel manufacturing process that uh, got the collagen to the form that we needed uh, for electro spinning, which is uh, not easy, uh, was developed by Sue and team um, over a number of years. And so we've been very fortunate that as we've grown, um, we've been able to grow with plant food and also start to move the technology into the um, hands of the primary sector uh, through uh, people like uh, Sanford. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if you know the Korean market, uh, and, and we're now in Japan and China as well, but um, like um, home shopping, we, we got a lot of uh, good fortune. We, we, we launched our campaign just when South Korea um, was going into lockdown. So there was a lot of people shopping at home um, and worried about their appearance, maybe on Zoom. And um, yeah, so we launched the product on all four shopping channels. Uh, major shopping channels and each one of them was a really big success in fact we sold out just about routinely every two weeks um, and about 30 percent of the buyers were um, yeah, repeat buyers as well which is a bit of a record in um, at least in the cosmetic space and in, um, in the korean home shopping market uh, look south korea is the hub of k beauty uh, they, they're very much the people that adopt new technologies first the rest of the world look at them to see uh, what's next in terms of ingredients or platforms uh, and also how to market these products. And there's a very big um, ODM market over there. So basically these are converters or formulators that um, you know, create cosmetic products for the big brands. And they you know, have a lot of pressure to come up with new um, ingredients and new platforms and new evidence for existing platforms uh, to make sure they keep the business of the of the big guys. So that for us has been a, a great channel uh, because we can now ship roles. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about marketing. Um, we work with the brands, but we ship the roles to these clients in Korea who cut and pack uh, on our behalf and, and typically manage the supply chain. So it's a, it's a great relationship because, you know, the things that are hard in New Zealand, 
is, is packaging, understanding these markets, shipping, um, and the like. And we've managed to get most of that out of our of our business now, which is fantastic. So the platform, you know, the science behind it, um, it, it is very unique. Uh, we have seen some copycat products turn up in the market, um, but they have a very small um, concentration of collagen and mostly they are uh, PVA, uh, so a water-soluble synthetic polymer. So they're kind of telling people the collagen masks, but they're virtually a glue mask um, and, and they're not going too well. So people are really seeing the collagen work incredibly well for um, hydration, uh, anti-wrinkle, and some of the ingredients that we're putting in are all targeted at brightening, tightening, uh, protection. There's a lot of science that we have to do to make sure that our technology, or, or our, the ingredients um, don't cross-link the collagen, they don't affect the stability, they don't affect our solutions. So there is a lot of work that we do um, in our uh, R&D team to make sure that we've got stable uh, formulations that don't spoil or react uh, to the collagen. We have to remember that it's still very active um, and especially volatile, uh, well, I wouldn't say volatile, I'd say um, vulnerable to um, environmental um, changes and the like, being in a nanofiber form. Um, and look, we've spent a lot of time, effort and money, even more in the future on uh, proving the evidence, proving this collagen is actually getting through the stratum corneum, proving that we're delivering actors and proving cosmetic results. And there's going to be a huge amount of work in that in the future years. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this just kind of just shows how we funded it, really. And, and uh, we've got MBI programs. Uh, we secured the license with uh, Plant and Foods Collagen Extraction Method. That gave us the ability to raise capital and invest in this opportunity. Um, and as we got some commercial traction, you know, it was all about scale up. And there were lots of uh, production challenges along the way. And we're really grateful for, you know, a very large team, not just um, Plant and Food, but Lazara, we're really supportive and a lot of people in the Nelson region, um, as well as Sanford. Um, and ourselves, you know, we spent a lot of time and effort on learning how the scale up of extraction affects the quality of the product, which then affects the quality of our product going forward. So there was quite a lot of work, uh, especially in uh, from 2020, 2021. Um, I was kind of asked to share some lessons uh, and these are pretty, pretty high level. Um, and everybody's got a different story when it comes to commercialization, but um, I think if I break it, our journey down into a few areas, um, collaboration for me is key. There was no way we, we could have done this as a company by ourselves. Um, so um, because of that, you know, you do rely on your partners and their expertise. Uh, and the key really is making sure there's a clear alignment of goals and everybody knows how they fit into the wider ecosystem. Um, I feel like that's typically where it all breaks down um, as nobody really quite knows who's doing what and why, uh, there's different expectations. Um, and what we're usually looking for as, as sorry, as industry is, is scientists having, you know, a really open, innovative, unencumbered relationship with the industry without too much commercial IP law kind of uh, people getting involved and in, in sometimes making the process quite difficult. So we've got to kind of find a way that we can truly collaborate on a technical level and to do that, you need to have understanding between all the key players about who wants what and who owns what. Uh, supply chains, um, really, these things can really hold you up. You, you can go really well in the, in the pilot scale, you can hit the market, and then all of a sudden, um, you don't know where you're going to get your, your feedstock from. So really understanding what the um, supply chain looks like early on or what it could look like and making sure everybody's lined up. Sorry, I've... Oh playing with my screens here. Um, expecting the unexpected <laughs> is another one. Um, here we go. Yeah, look, it's not till you're in market that you really understand what the market needs. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, um, it's really good to stay close to um, regulations. Uh, every country, you've got a different story, you've really got to understand what your customer needs, um, product variances, um, supply chain variances, um, 
you know, consumer trends, everything's going to play a part in the, in the food nutraceuticals place. And one of the big learnings for us is that we really love the waste to value story here. And, and I hear it a lot in the cyber marine sector. And um, it's something we learned very early on in market is they don't want to hear the word waste. Um, they want to hear value, but they want to hear premium nutraceutical uh, specifically extracted for, um, you know, um, their application. They, they don't like to see the word waste. Uh, they don't like to see dead fish in the promotion or anything like that. So um, just kind of, uh, we've got to understand that, you know, sustainability is great. Waste to value is a great thing for New Zealand and a great thing for that industry and the feedstock, but it's, it's probably not a big marketing point uh, going overseas. So that's something else we've learned. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I think just a thank you, especially to Plant and Food um, for inviting us. And um, yeah, just that, that key message, collaboration, this is what, what's super important. Um, with the cyber marine program and you can see a lot of collaboration happening there and, and you know we we fully support it great <clears throat> thanks ian um really interesting presentation there uh, so last but not least we have dr matthew cumming who is going to take us all the way back to the middle ages and present some medieval science on the alchemy of marine extracts but with a modern twist. Matt is a research team leader of marine polymer science here in Nelson and leads cyber marine research aim 1.4, looking at molecular fractionation, modification and formulation of concept products. Take it away, Matt. Uh, thank you, Ivan. You can see that all right? Yes. Cool. Um, uh, thank you, Ian, for including the, um, the lessons that you've learned I think every single lesson that you mentioned, I think I know exactly what you mean when you say, say those points. Um, so as Ivan mentioned, I'm leading one of the research aims 1.4. Um, I called this presentation Spinning Fish into Gold. Um, and it's, it's really, oh, I don't know, how do you, okay. It was really about, um, well, a story that I'll mention later, but this, one, this aim is really about how we're developing uh, novel products. As uh, Sue mentioned early in, the, in her introduction presentation, uh, there really has been bugger all new products that have come out of um, marine sources for quite some time. And the question that, that we have to ask is, um, what is New Zealand going to do about that? Um, can we produce new products that set us apart from the rest of the other markets? Um, and I feel with cyber marine, kind of now is the time uh, to do so. So spinning into gold, um, for those who can't remember their childhood, I'll just tell you a story about uh, Rumpelstiltskin. So in this story, there's a mill owner um, who boasts to the king that his daughter can spin straw into gold. And so the, gold, the king was really keen on this. So he um, got the daughter to try and make gold from straw. And obviously the daughter couldn't do it. Um, so she, in desperation, got Rumpelstiltskin to do it for her. Um, and Yeah, and so she did that, and as you, as the end of the story goes, I think she had to give up her firstborn child, but she managed to guess his name, so so that's okay. And the reason I mentioned the story was that I see the straw as being the materials that you already have, and maybe the spinning wheel is the um, the infrastructure that we already have and that Rumpelstiltskin is now the, 
scientific knowledge, the magic, maybe the, maybe the ugly scientists to transform in the materials that you have into something special to create novel and ex exciting products. So uh, in earlier, we mentioned in the we heard about how we're getting all these separated components out of the fishes. Um, and then through um, purification, chemical modification or restructuring of these molecules using green and efficient methods, we can kind of transform them into brand new products. And actually I don't like the mill, the um, spinning wheel kind of looks a bit old. I think something more like this would be better suited to what we're trying to achieve, taking your old crappy car and turning it into something nice and special that'll give us brand new, never seen before products. So the first approach is um, purification um, of and characterization of novel proteins, novel lipids, um, and all the other novel carbohydrates that might be in the fish. Um, there's, there's more than just um, fatty acids and collagen in, in a fish. Um, but it's not until we uh, purify them using the green methods um, that we can start producing products that are of research grade or upper diagnostics grades so that um, we can then produce a higher value product. Um, Owen mentioned earlier about Cynthia's work on soil transferases. It's a good example of a protein that um, that hasn't been extracted from fish before and does have novel activities um, that are extremely useful in um, diagnostics or uh, manufacturing reactions. The other, and I think Ellie went through this very well with lipids and carbohydrates, but because I'm a collagen scientist, I'm going to use collagen as an example. Um, collagen is fantastic because it's got lots of groups that we can do chemical modifications or pimp my collagen, um, that we can do things like we can attach it to another collagen molecule and by doing that, you reduce its solubility, change its gel strength, and then you can start applying it, start using the collagen in say 3D printing, which we are working with Otago University and with Alex Leonard um, to produce uh, tissue engineering within the program. Um, another thing that's really exciting and that I really like is the attachment of bioactive molecules. Um, in Alex's PhD, we're working with uh, attaching bioactives that increase the cell biology, make the cells respond better. Um, but these bioactives could really be anything you want. Um, antioxidants, other carbohydrates, um, to really change its functionality and change how it behaves. The third approach that we're using is this novel restructuring of proteins and lipids. Um, this is where we get the ingredients that have been processed um, earlier. And we either, with or without the kind of pimp my ride, um, modifications that we might need to do. 
might need to go through a purification step as well. But from that, we can start doing, um, start creating brand new structures. And these might be um, coacivates that can be used for encapsulating new chem um, molecules. We can produce superstructures or fibrils that could be used for cell scaffolds for, um, for the biomedical devices. The ability to kind of make it form aggregates by itself or even the fibrils can spontaneously form um, can opens up these new new foods and new food textures um, and I think in in this case um, Ian's technology is a form of how we restructured the collagen to to form these nanofibers um, and one thing I mentioned didn't mention earlier but the novel modifications what it can do is you can produce a molecule that can then be used in a technology um, that you probably didn't think was possible um, so I just wanted to make that a short talk because I know it was uh, at the end of the day um, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank Callahan, Deakin, and Otago University for helping me out in this um, research aim. And thank you very much.